Hey, everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Travis Live Show here on Creative Live. You know, the show where I sit down with amazing humans and I unpack their brains with the goal of helping you live your dreams and career and hobby and in life. Our guest today is the one and only Pulitzer Prize winning poet, Jericho Brown. Now, Dr. Brown is an amazing poet, obviously, if you win the Pulitzer, but more than that, he is a speaker of truth. We cover all kinds of things in this episode besides poetry, but the underpinning of this is how do you do something that is hard and difficult and beautiful and inspiring and the thing that is your calling in life, whether that is pursuing a life of words and academics and um, trying to drive and change in popular culture or whether it's to leave the job that you hate to become or be something that you want more than anything else in this world. I think it's fascinating if I asked 100 people what they want to do, the number of people who probably say, I want to be a poet, is right up there with the fewest, <laughs> the smallest number. And so right now you might be sitting there thinking, I want to be a, a photographer, a designer, I want to start a startup. If, if thinking that or saying those words out loud is intimidating because it seems like a wild, hairy, audacious goal. Try telling the world that you're going to be a poet and then becoming that thing and being one of the best in the world at it. That is the mindset, a little bit of the background of Dr. Jericho Brown. He performs a poem in this episode, which is absolutely, um, it is incredible, very, very powerful. That's at the end of the show. So many other things, uh, including um, his we cover his uh, book, The Tradition, which is the, the piece that he won the Pulitzer uh, for so powerful. Um, so if having some daily habits that support your big goals, if having a big audacious goal, or if you are unclear about the power of words to transform um, your mindset and popular culture at large, uh, if any of that is interesting to you, you are going to love this episode. So I'm going to get out of the way before we do. Um, well, I'm just getting it out of the way and, and introduce again, Dr. Jericho Brown. They love you. Jericho, it's been a long time in the making. I want to say thank you for being here and a huge welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Chase. Thank you for having me. Uh, I confess, before we started recording, I was um, I was sharing my enthusiasm, my awe at winning the the Pulitzer Prize. Um, how how does that feel, man? That's got to be incredible. It feels great. It feels very busy, um, but it's <laughs> nice, you know. Uh, if I hadn't won it, I might not get the chance to meet you, right? So I'm glad I did. Oh. Wow. <laughs> my wife is, has been a longtime fan of your work and introduced That's me to great. it some time ago. And so we've been working on this for a while. Oh, wonderful. Um, and, and the timing of the Pulitzer couldn't, couldn't be better for, for us, for the show, but just what an absolute honor. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to retrace is a little bit about your process. Another thing I'd like to retrace is the work that it takes to be recognized to the degree that you've been recognized. Uh, but more importantly, for anyone who's not familiar with your work, you're a poet, but I'd like to go way back in the way back machine here and paint us a little bit of a picture around your uh, childhood, early um, affect and creativity, um, what, what helped contribute uh, to the person you are today. Let's, let's go back for a little bit for people who are new to your work. Well, there are a few things that help contribute. One probably is the black church. I had a um, a very interesting, my, my parents are a very interesting couple. Uh, they fought every Saturday night, but they didn't miss church on Sunday morning. Uh, we all play cards every Friday night. So I hope that gives people some kind of a picture of what it was like growing up in my house. And because we were at church, excuse me, because we were at church on every Sunday, I, I fell in love with the music. I fell in love with the excitement. Uh, and I fell in love with the sound of words. Uh, you know, the black church is a place where obviously very young people, people uh, from the point that they can first speak to the age of 17 or 18, 
uh, when they, you know, when they're grown, uh, you have the responsibility of every once in a while speaking at the church. There seems uh, always a program, a pageant or a play in which you have to perform um, every month or sometimes every two or three weeks. And, uh, you know, even a little kid might say something like Happy Easter and everybody in the church would fall out screaming, you know. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so and I love that. I learned that that words had um, had power and that they could do something to our emotions. Uh, and right along with hearing uh, and performing, um, seeing young people perform of uh, things like uh, rec- recitations of the 23rd Psalms. Uh, you'd also see people reading and performing in the church um, poems like uh, Mother to Son or The Negro Speaks of The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes or Ego Trippin' by Nikki Giovanni or Phenomenal Woman or Still I Rise by uh, Maya Angelou. So I was never far away from poems. They were always a part of my life. And the Bible as a source of poetry was introduced to me very early, seeing my pastor read scriptures and then explain them to us in such a um, excited and ex- exciting way uh, was very important to me. And I think it has a lot to do with, with why I fell in love with words and why I fell in love with poetry. I also had a mother who was, um, she was just, she was an improvisational genius. She couldn't afford childcare. So she'd take me and my sister to the library. Uh, and at the time, you know, now when you go in a library, the first two floors are all computers. But at the time, there was nothing in the library but books. So my sister and I had no choice but to become readers. My sister was actually way better at using the library than I was. She was she would watch movies and listen to records. You know, I was like, wow, where'd you find that? <laughs> um, but I, I was uh, I had um, just a really short attention span, which is the best thing that ever happened to me, because I think that's the reason why. I fell in love with poetry. I would, uh, I would go through the stacks, and when I would come across a book of poetry, I would try it out. And I didn't have this idea that I had to know what was going on every line. I only had to feel what was happening, much in the same way uh, we experience songs the first time we hear them. Uh, we don't always know the lyrics, but we know we're turned on. So uh, it got to a point where the librarian, I'll never forget her name, Laura McKinney, she would have a stack of poetry books waiting for me. You know, they were, whether they knew it or not, they were our babysitters. And uh, the librarians would have poetry books waiting for me, and I would read them cover to cover, thinking I was somehow cheating because there was less text on the page than there was <laughs> in a book of prose. I was like, oh, I can do this. And I had no idea, you know, and it was wonderful because. Um, Laura McKinney and the other libraries, they didn't, they didn't, they were not poetry readers. They knew I liked poetry as a very little kid. And I'm talking about six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. Wow. They knew I liked poetry. So they were giving me the best things for that. I was reading the poets that they had heard of, um, which means I was reading what was completely inappropriate for an eight year old to be reading. Uh, so it was wonderful, a wonderful situation I had there. You know, I was learning about sex. I was learning about politics and war. I was learning about relationships between men and women, uh, between men and men and Walt Whitman. Uh, so I was getting I was getting a lot. And before by the time I was 10, I had read um, a lot of Sylvia Plath, Robert Lowell, uh, wow. Ann Sexton, um, Whitman, Dickinson, uh, Langston at Hughes, 10. A dove. Yeah, at 10 yeah. years old? Wow. Yeah, because I would just read it like it was a marathon, man. And I would feel the language. I was much more interested in the feeling and the sound, the fact that I could read words on a page, and it was as if they were coming off the page and I could hear them. Uh, that's what poetry always seemed. That seemed to me the definition at the time. If you could read something and no one's speaking, and yet when you read it, you hear the words that I thought that was so amazing. And I wanted that. I wanted to do that. I wanted to make that feeling I was happy. I was having, I wanted to make that feeling happen to other people. So um, I think that's how things really got started for me. Although, you know, I wouldn't give my depressed nine year old an Anne Sexton poem. You know, she has poems with titles like wanting to die, which I think I know by heart. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, um, so, uh, but but at the time it was it was just it was just what I needed, and I think it saved me in ways that I didn't know it was saving me. Can you talk about being depressed as a nine-year-old? 
How did you know that? Is that something you knew at the time or is this on reflection? You now know, come, come to know these things. You mentioned your parents fighting on Saturday night. Was Did that contribute to uh, your art in some way or help, can you help understand, help us understand that a little bit? Well, when I was nine, I knew I wanted out. And even before then, I knew that I was sort of on this lease, right? I, I was sort of, I mean, from the time I was six or seven, I had this idea that I was counting down time to get out. And if I could just hold on, I wouldn't die or get killed. I kept thinking if I stayed in my parents' house, something awful was bound to happen to me or I was bound to do something awful to myself. So uh, that's the best way I could explain that feeling. I just needed to get out. I was just seeing way too much. Um, many, And it's not special. It's maybe I'm just sensitive. You know, many kids see way too much. But I think it affected me more deeply because I'm a person of the word. I'm a person of words. So I always, I was always writing. Uh, I fell in love with poems and I was always in a corner somewhere with a notebook writing things down, uh, which was um, my own way of having a private life. So, yeah. Would you, would you characterize yourself as a super feeler? Like you talked about, you know, a lot of kids see too much and you know, for some, they bounce off it and we all create these coping mechanisms. That's, you know, we all have childhood trauma in some way, shape or form. Um, but do you think that, you know, I I consider my wife, for example, is she's so hyper sensitive about so many things like what she eats and the feelings and the energy of different people. And would you, would you put yourself in that camp or I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to understand, you know, the, the things that contributed to your, your ability to use words to express just incredibly detailed and powerful emotions and experiences. Yeah, I I think my real problem as a kid growing up, and maybe you know only only recently, I mean, really a problem I'm only solving now is that when people say things, I believe them. So when I was a kid, and people would say things, I thought they meant it. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, when my dad said. Um, you know, this is the way things are going to be. And when you move out, you can do it whatever way you want to. I thought that was true. I didn't realize that after I moved out, he was still going to be trying to run my life. Do you know I mean? So, um, so, and, and, you know, preachers, very, I mean, being around very good people, I believed um, that the height of personhood was the ability to fall in love, to be in love, to love something, to express passion. And I also understood at a very young age that you don't get to express passion. You don't get to fall in love unless you can become vulnerable, vulnerable. You don't get to experience intimacy without first having vulnerability. Um, So I was always seeking intimacy. Uh, Still am always seeking intimacy, uh, which means I was always becoming vulnerable. And I think for most young people, that's not an option because they're not paying attention uh, in the same way that I was paying and like, uh, and probably maybe paying attention too early or for too long. Yeah. So most of the people who listen and watch the show are, there's an element of seeking. And I feel like that has been a theme of the show to, you know, the, the guests yourself, uh, hundreds of others. They, the people I like to have on the show are people who have found something. And for so many who are listening and watching, whether that's a better version of themselves or a new career, a different partner or something. Um, and this idea of becoming a poet, for example, incredibly romantic. Um, Hmm. but as you, it's steeped in words and emotions and experiences, the ability to express oneself, that's, those are all very powerful and useful. They're, They're utilities in life as well. So I'm wondering did the seven, eight, nine, ten year old version of yourself, despite knowing that you loved words, was there a, uh, an awareness that like poet didn't really seem like an option to me when I was 10, mm-hmm. either based on my upbringing, my experience, um, probably, a, you know, mm-hmm. confounding set of factors. But there's so many people who are listening and watching right now who would have been afraid to declare themselves a poet because it's lofty and, as, you know, it's aspirational. And and whether their their goal would be to, to become a poet, um, just the concept of being able to become whatever it is we want in this world. And so I'm wondering if you can help shape this 
the notion of becoming a poet, of starting, you know, you say words matter. And did you start to call yourself a poet or did other people call your, you, you a poet? And how did you sort of, you know, connect that identity piece of you? I just help, help me understand identi- po- poet as identity for you. Yeah. Well, I'll say first that I knew I wanted to be a poet when I was in the third grade. And I was certain of it, 100 percent sure when I was in the fifth grade. Um, I didn't really know what that meant. I only knew that Rita Dove was a poet. Do you know what I mean? Like the only living poet I understood existed was Rita Dove because there were life size posters of her in my elementary school after she won the Mm -hmm. Pulitzer Prize, you know. So uh, and that seemed to me the best thing that could possibly happen to a person. You get life-size posters of yourself in an elementary school. I was like, oh, sure, why not? (laughs) And you know, um, what's wonderful about my mom and dad and uh, and also strange about them is that they were completely encouraging of that when I was six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 and 11, 12 years old. It's just that I kept saying it and they were confused as to why I thought (laughs) that, you know, I believed them when they would encourage me that I could write, Mm -hmm. I believed them. And so when they began to try to take it back in my late teens and my early 20s, by that time, I was like, you must be lying this time because you couldn't have been lying last time because I can write. Do you know what I mean? Um, So and that's uh, so I think part of the identity was just built up by the encouragement of the few people that were around me, my parents, my teachers who, you know, said I had a little bit of talent at writing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's all it really took for me. As I said before, when people said stuff, I believed them. People said I could write. Okay. Uh, (laughs) I didn't know to doubt people until until later in my life. And then um, I think I I sort of gained. Secondly, I put on uh, that feeling that people try to give you that that doing an art is impossible, that it's impossible to be a dancer or an actor or a poet. And yet you turn on your TV and all you see is dancers and actors do, do you understand yeah. what i mean you, this is part of the i think the modern conundrum is we see you know first of all it's very you, you can't be what you can't see and then the things that we do see you know the the people that are most celebrated in our culture for better or worse they didn't go to this school get these grades get the right job you know get you know work for 40 years and get the gold watch and retire they took radical action on things that were not the traditional paths and so there's this there's this lack of alignment between you know our our the things that we see and our you know what what we could you know, so cast as our dreams and the stuff that our parents tell us, okay, you got to go do these things. And there's this mm-hmm. huge gap. And so that's really, I mean, you just hit, hit, hit right on the head. Like that's what I'm exploring that gap for you. And the fact that you had encouragement to, you know, use your words and to write as a young person, was there a time when that shifted gears? And it's like, okay, good job. Uh, writing time's over. Now you want to go get a job, and you need to, you know, it, was there, was that, You've, you've kind of danced around it a little bit. You said later in life, your parents started telling you you couldn't write. So was this a, okay, now it's time to, the kid stuff's over, time to get back to business now and, and go get a J-O-B? Or, yeah, or what I, was that like? It is true that I came probably at some point while I was in college. I had this idea that, I mean, it hadn't changed that I wanted to be a poet. I always wanted to be a poet. But I had this idea suddenly, not so suddenly, it gets nailed into you because this is how people treat artists. But I had this idea that I had to be old in order to do it. Like I needed a beard and it needed to be white. Do you understand what I'm saying? And given I do, yeah. I, saw, I needed a white beard. I needed to be a white man with a white beard yep. who had already had 19 jobs. And that would allow me, <laughs> the, I, that would mean that I had paid the dues necessary to become a poet. Uh, but that changed for me, I think, for a few reasons. One is that... Um, I, I was still an English major and I was still writing. My first job was writing speeches for that. I was a speech writer for the mayor of New Orleans. So I was still writing. Um, I just needed to take the leap and, and um, really devote myself to my art 100%. And once I was willing to do that, uh, and I began doing that pretty soon after I finished undergrad, once I began to take the leap just to completely say, oh, I could lose everything. So let me tell you how I began to understand that that was an okay thing to say. The only reason I began to understand that was uh, an okay thing to say is because everybody I ever admired said that. You know, Mm. I mean, ultimately, 
that's all Jesus said. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. All Martin Luther King Jr. said. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So everybody who had ever been given to me as a person to emulate was a person who was, it seemed to me, insane. Do you follow it? Like if you look at the yeah. risks that these people, if you think about the writers we love most and you look at their lives and you look at the risks that they took to get their writing done. And I was like, I mean, even as a very young person in my early 20s, I realized, wait, you have to lose your mind? <laughs> do you know what I mean? And really, I don't feel like you have to lose your mind, but you do have to be in a position where people around you might think you have. And mm. that's going to be their business. Yeah. You have to let that be their business. So I think for me, it just had to do with understanding that everyone who had ever done anything that I thought admirable um, every one of those people had lived lives where they needed to take the leap. They needed to do the unconventional, unexpected, risky and dangerous thing to be who they are. And, uh, and that's, what I, that's what I became willing to do. I remember I um, walked into my boss's office. Uh, her name was Rhonda. And I, uh, I had enrolled in these classes at the University of New Orleans because I wanted to start, you know, poetry classes to get an MFA because I was going to be a poet. And uh, I said, I'm taking this class, but the only time it's offered is at 930. So I have to quit my job. And I didn't have a plan. Like I found out, I literally had only found, before walking into her office, I found out the class was only offered at 930, you know, like, like five minutes before. And she came up with a way for me to go to that class and then take the hour later at work. But if I hadn't asked, that wouldn't have happened. If I hadn't been ready to lose my job and yeah. be hungry that wouldn't have happened. So I just, I had to take the leap. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that I mean uh, when I say take the leap, when I say take the risk. Uh, and that's, all, that's what I'm always telling my students. My students, one thing that is 100% true about my students is that they are completely vulnerable to and in love with poems. And they read these poems, they'll bring me poems, they say, Dr. Brown, I love this poem, oh my God. And they're like crying with tears in their eyes. And I say to them, you know, if that's what you want, then you have to be able to make those kinds of moves in poems. You have to be able to take those kinds of risks in poems. So what happens early on in my classes is students are trying to stay safe, but yeah. you're not going to do what you love to do, staying safe. You know, and that's the case for anybody. I mean, it's not just the artists. You know, if you, I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever, I'm the only person probably who um, obsesses over Serena Williams' stretch routine or her pra or, her, or watching her practice. Like, I don't even like to watch her play. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. No, I've I'm photographed obsessed. Serena a couple times. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm obsessed <laughs> by, like, what goes into the day yeah. she has to play. Like, what comes yeah. before that day, you know? And that's what I'm, that's what I'm always telling my students. Uh, it's one thing to admire people. It's one thing to have a dream of becoming someone. But it's another thing to take that identity seriously. Yeah. And if you want to be a poet, what does that look like? Well, it might look like you're reading poems every day. It might look like you're trying to write one every day. That doesn't mean that you end up with a poem every day. That means you put forth the effort. Uh, it is actually better to fail. Because if you're failing, that means you're trying hard. That means you're trying above yourself. Uh, that means you have some ambition. So, yeah. I definitely, I want to put a pin in the students because it's so much of the research that I did on you, your TED talk, for example, you're always referencing the experiences of your students. And that's, you know, kind of the way that I'm trying to look at that. Our conversation today is if we are students of you and your work and your life and your experience, um, it's just, I, I find it interesting that you do so much celebrating of that. Is that because you found that path for yourself? you feel like it's a path? Or why is it that you're always taking, whether it's inspiration or examples, or you, you just, you speak so much and so fondly of, you know, your role as a teacher, but more specifically, the opportunity for students? Well, I mean, it's probably because I'm sort of a new agey weirdo, honestly. <laughs> I, mean, my, I mean, my students, my students could have gone to any college and they could have had any other creative writing teacher, but they came to Emory and they're my students. And so I think that means that uh, they are mine and I am theirs for the rest of their lives. 
Uh, right. and, uh, and I love them. I love them because they're in the class, not because of anything. You know, you love people because they're yours. You don't love them because of what they do or don't do. You know, you mentioned your wife earlier. You know, um, there are things that could happen to your wife that would put her in a position where she's not the same person she is now, but yep. because she's your wife, because she is who she is to you, you will always love her. Do yeah. you understand what I'm saying? And Absolutely. that's how I feel about my students. I love my students. Uh, my students show up in my class and I think, OK, here we go. You came here for a reason. Um, let's do it. Uh, and they walk with me as I'm writing my poems uh, and I make them aware of that. You know, I don't just teach them. They teach me. My students put me in a position where I have to look for more than what I really want to read <laughs> in order to show them yeah. what might influence them. Yeah. Uh, there are things that they want to do in their poems that require me to look up poems that I may not have seen before so I can give them examples of how that's been done in the past. Um, I see them doing things and I, 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 I see coming out of my mouth telling them, you can't do that in a poem. And before I can get it out of my mouth, I'm thinking, or can you? And then as soon as I think, or can you, I have to go prove it in my own poem. So my students are walking with me, uh, not to mention the fact, you know, uh, the way this, uh, the way the higher educational system works in the United States, you know, my students right now, the oldest one of them is probably 22 years old, but that oldest student will probably still be asking me for letters of recommendation when, uh, when he or she or, or they are, are, are 42 years old. Do you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I'm in a position where I'm walking with them for the rest of my life and I'm theirs and they're mine. It's very inspirational. Um, also, a thing that comes to mind is the opportunity. You know, you referenced uh, earlier. Um, you know, Rita Dove as a huge um, inspiration to you, but you also mentioned a lot of white males and this the concept of you needed a white beard in order to be established enough and you know fill in the blank adjective enough to be considered seriously a poet. And if you, if you combine those ideas with this idea that I feel strongly about, which is, you know, it's very hard to be what you can't see. Um, how did those two ideas reconcile the, the fact that Rita Dove, for example, or Maya Angelou were huge inspirations to you, but you know, the canon was largely white male, old, you know, Melville, you know, you've, you cited a bunch of names. How did you reconcile those or, or did you at all? Yeah, I didn't understand completely. I mean, the one, I mean, I just, I was ignorant. Do you know what I mean? You know, Young, um, yeah, yeah. there is, there is, uh, and maybe there was more than there is now, a such thing as black music, right? Uh, but you know, the queen of soul is Aretha Franklin. So um, if Aretha Franklin is the queen of soul, my access to Aretha Franklin means that that's all I know about music. That's what music is. That's what it should sound like, you know. And um, when you watch uh, Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace, that uh, when you hear that record or when you watch the documentary, the live taping of, of her recording that record, yeah, there are a lot of black people in that church shouting. There's white people in that church too. So I did understand that racism, my dad made sure of that, my mom made sure that we understood, me and my sister, we understood uh, that racism existed. Uh, and yet we understood that our uh, job was to be all of who we could possibly be, you know, and I believed that. So I think uh, while I understood that the canon looked a certain way, I didn't have an understanding of there being a canon until mm -hmm. I was much older. So when mm -hmm. I was younger, the poets who were introduced to me, you know, when I went to school, when I went to church, whenever I was around poetry, there were, yes, a lot of white poets, but there were also black poets. You know, there was Claude McKay, there was County Cullen, there was Langston Hughes. Uh, so there were, it seemed to me, a lot of black poets. I, you know? yeah. And it wasn't uh, until, I mean, really, until I was a grown man that I understood that even those poets had been marginalized, right? Mm -hmm. That even those poet had been get, poets had been ghettoized, right? But I didn't know that. I mean, I just thought, Oh, wow. These are some of the greatest poets that ever lived. Um, you know, If We Must Die is a poem that people know. 
without even knowing Claude McKay's name. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing I think. Um, that's the kind of thing that I think helped me overcome those those kinds of things as it relates to as it relates to racism or as, as it relates to not having a vision of oneself. I did have that vision. It's just that that vision began to change the more I went to school. The more I went to school, the more I was I realized. Oh, I rem- I'll never forget when I was in a PhD program, and I would go to my professors' homes and I would go to my classmates' homes. And for various gatherings, social gatherings, study group, whatever, and I would look at their shelves and it became sort of a um, game that I was playing. Uh, I would look at the shelves and they wouldn't have any black people on their shelves. Mm. I was I was like, wow. And I would go house after house after house. I was like, oh, this is the way it really is. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got all these white people on my shelves and y'all... No wonder y'all treat me like this. You don't think you have to see me anymore after today. Do you know what I'm saying? So then it became my job to prove them wrong, right? Uh, If if people are subliminally subliminally telling you they're never going to see you again, you have to show them that they're wrong. Do you know what I'm saying? So that really, it became a goal of mine to show them that I could write and that I could end up on the shelves, if not on their shelves, on their kids' shelves. That... This idea of um, requiring that they see you by being so good at your craft or um, by showing up over and over again, has that been fuel for your career or was that a, was that a secondary, tertiary um, reason for deciding to commit as you, as you did early on? I think uh, proving something to people who doubt you um, can be very useful, I have to admit. Uh, And yet it cannot be the focus. Uh, It can't be primary. Uh, The reason it can't be primary is if you really want to succeed at a thing, you have to love it. You can't succeed at a thing out of spite. (laughs) You know what I mean? Uh, Because the truth is that if you're doing something out of spite, then you're doing it out of fear. It's not based in love, it's based in fear. Mm -hmm. And anything you put fear into is gonna give you fear back. So this world that I have created and built for myself is a world that I have created because I love poetry, I believe in it. It makes me cry, it makes me wanna make love. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, It excites me. I first I have to believe in it and it changes my mind. I think, you know, I have to a lot of people don't know this about what poets are doing, but uh, maybe and maybe I'm wrong about what other poets are doing. But I know when I'm writing a poem, I'm trying to figure out what I think. And I know I'm really working when I say something in a poem I didn't expect to say. And it makes me wonder if that's what I think thought all along. Is that what I think? That's what I'm saying when I'm writing poems. And that's the reckoning that I have to come to as a human being. I say something I didn't expect to say it. I wonder about it. And then I say, well, if that's what I think, maybe I should start acting like it. Maybe my life should look like it. Maybe my words when I'm having conversations should reflect that that's actually what I think. So that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of work I'm interested in doing in my Mm -hmm. poems. And that's what comes first for me. What comes first for me isn't Spite, although spite don't always hurt. It ain't the worst thing. (laughs) But what comes first for me has to be love. And I just love doing it. I love listening to poems and I love setting those challenges for myself, not for other people, uh, that I can write a poem that does this or I can try a poem that does that. That's that's all Jericho Brown. Uh, Speaking of Jericho Brown and words that uh, you used words like vulnerable, authentic, or maybe I used authentic, you used vulnerable, um, you know, seeking, wanting to be inspired and, and feel love and connection and passion. If I kind of made a word cloud, uh, I want to read a few words that some other people have said about you that paint a similar picture. And I'm wondering if you can respond uh, as to if you think these people are accurate or what color you would add to their um, their response to your work. Um, Terrence Hayes wrote, 
this is the poetry of bloodship, the meaning of family, of love, of sexuality, the resonance of pain, and the possibilities of redemption. Uh, Craig Morgan uh, Tyker said in an NPR interview, "What's most remarkable in these poem in, in these poems is that while they never stop speaking through gritted teeth, never quite." make the choice between hope and fear they are always beautiful full of music that is a cross between the sinuous sentences of carl phillips the forceful descriptions of mark doty and hip rhythms of terence hayes Mm -hmm. they show brown to be a part of a new guard of black and gay writers unwilling in their writing to confine their identities these poems offer an unlikely kind of hope Brown's ambivalence is evidence of a fragile belief in the possibility of change, of the will that makes change possible. And lastly, as Claudio Rankin simply puts, Jericho Brown's poems offer the readers a window into his devastating genius. Now, to have those writers refer to you and your work like that, how does how does that make you feel? Are they accurate? Do you does that bring you joy, or did they get it wrong? Um, I was hoping to get your your response to some of those words. Um, it's really hard to talk about without getting emotional, uh, quite honestly, because uh, I admire those writers in their in their work so much. Uh, so when they have nice things to say about my work, um, and it just it's um. The value of being recognized by people that you love the most or that you admire the most or or people whose work really makes you feel um i don't you can't i can't put a price on that so it's um it's almost difficult (laughs) it's almost difficult for me to talk about so i'm glad obviously um that they can recognize what i'm trying to do in the work and that they recognize things sometimes that i don't even know that i'm trying to do um uh, that I mean, maybe that's the most I can, maybe that's the most I can say about that. I could, um, yeah, I'll, I, I think that's it. Thank you for sharing. I, those are powerful words to read about anybody's work. And I can't imagine hearing that about your own work. That's, uh, devastating genius. Um, yeah, that's crazy, man. She's great. <laughs> um, is poetry having it's a, a new day in the sun right now? Yourself winning the Pulitzer, Amanda Gorman, like what what what's going on with poetry right now? Is it has this been a buildup or has it always been there and pop culture is just now paying closer attention? Is it is there a resurgence? Like what's 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 happening with with poetry right now? It seems I mean, again, it's always been a mainstay. It's a classic. It's like underpins you know, modern culture in so many ways goes way, way, way back thousands of years. And yet here we are. And I can't help but feel this groundswell. And I'm wondering, clearly you have been a force uh, in this. I don't know if it's it's appropriate to call it a movement. I'm just wondering if you can help, help me or maybe our listeners understand like what, what's, what's happening right now with poetry? Why is it everywhere? Or has it been everywhere and now, we're just getting, you know, it's just, it's just coming back around. Well, poetry is a, a spiritual thing. And when, um, when our spirits, uh, for whatever reason, when, you know, the spirit is always strong, but when we feel as if the spirit is weak, uh, we seek it out. Uh, we seek poetry out uh, at our hardest times. Um, and sometimes we take it for granted, right, at our, at our easiest times. Uh, and I think that poetry... Um, poets have been the heroes of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, you know, obviously, first responders have been the heroes of the coronavirus coronavirus pandemic. All of the medical um, people who work in in healthcare, uh, and yet, um, I've worked so much. I've been called on to do all kinds of things that I think I otherwise would have never been called to do. And uh, I'm really grateful to be a poet right now. I'm grateful to be somebody who can show people the value of the thing that they've been missing. Uh, People didn't know that they were missing poetry. They didn't know how much they needed in their lives. They didn't know 
um, what it could do for them. Uh, the thing about poetry is it's, it works the same way your microwave works. It works the same way your car works. But you don't know what it's doing. You know your car takes you from one place to another. You know your microwave heats, heats up your food. You read a poem. You have a bunch of feelings. But you don't know what that's doing for your soul or your, your mental capacity. Um, and yet it does its work. And I think people realized uh, this pandemic that they needed a spiritual source to do work on their lives. Um, and I think poetry allows uh, folk that 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 work, they allow, it allows that work that they need. Uh, so I think this is a, a really great moment for poetry because the poets get to be who they are in public. You know, we'll we'll be doing this. You know, there'll come a time where nobody's paying attention um, again, right? Where nobody is paying attention in this very broad way that they're suddenly paying attention about the environment or about racial justice. Uh, but the poets will still be writing about these things. The poets will still be uh, making the work necessary such that whether we are alive or not, the work is here when you need it, when you realize there's a need for racial justice, when you realize there's a, re a need for envir environmental justice. Uh, when you begin to understand that again, when you realize uh, that we can all fall prey to the deaths and the grief that come along with a pandemic, um, when you realize that the poems will still be here, and yes, they'll they'll um, they will become popular yet again um, because we need poetry in our lives. Let me tell you what poems are. Poems are to men uh, and women and as as trees are to God. Um, so we walk around all day, every day with trees. We sort of, I mean, I don't, I mean, I love trees, you know. I live in Atlanta, it's a very green city. I see trees all the time. Sometimes, you know, I can drive by a bunch of trees and I might not notice any of them. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. I'm looking out right now, I'm looking in my backyard. A lot of trees. Do you know what I'm saying? I can name a few of them for you, you know. But here's what I know to be true. I will take those trees for granted. There are many times I do not notice them, don't care that they're there. My need for those trees is not my need for oxygen. My need for those trees has to do with the fact that if all those trees were gone, I would miss them. Like if all the trees in your life weren't there, you would miss them. You would miss them like crazy. You would be concerned. You would be worried. You would you would um, write to your congressman trying to figure out how do we get the trees back? And that's what poems do. People don't know they need poetry. They don't understand what poems have done in their lives. But if there were no poems, they would suddenly understand. You know, and that's how that's what poems mean. Um, that's what poems mean. When I'm on airplanes, people will ask me um, what I do for a living, which, by the way, I think. Oh, you got to be a fascinating passenger to sit next to. My goodness. <laughs> no, I try to sleep, really. <laughs> um, and I'll tell them I'm a poet. And then they'll say this happens. People, what do you do? I'm a poet. I hate poetry. People will tell me I hate poetry. I just told you this is all I care about. And you tell me you hate. <laughs> um, people tell me I hate poetry. And what I've learned to do over the years is to say to them right after they say I hate poetry, I say to them, really, you don't like any poem. There's not one poem you love. And for every person that's ever said I hate poetry, they then tell me a poem they love. And most of them recite it. They mm. recite uh, a Robert Frost poem or E.E. E. Cummings poem or a Langston Hughes poem or an Emily Dickinson poem to me, a Sylvia Plath poem. They recite that poem to which I say, oh, it doesn't seem to me like you hate poetry since this one has sustained you the last 50 years of your life. Do you follow what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Like, you, like if you it's read like a my tree. Poem, it's yes. like a tree, right? I get it. Poem, you've been walking around letting this one poem do all this work on you your entire life and you think you hate poetry? Imagine if you had actually read three poems. 
it's incredible that there's someone who's going to sit next to you on a plane and say that they hate poetry. I mean, this is, this is, <laughs> but this is part of the, like why I asked the question about poetry's place in, in pop culture, because it seems like it's everywhere. It seems like so many folk. I mean, I we've had say Cory Booker on the show and Cory can just like rip off poem, 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 poem. And it seems to come from, he's like an old soul. And so it seems like it comes from a different time. And yet when you look around, you think about hip hop music, you think about the power of words in the media. And it seems to be obvious why poetry would be so powerful. Um, and I think it's an interesting point that you make that it's because it's, it, it does underpin so much. So it, it's rooted in our past or something. I think like, there's just such a mm -hmm. strong connection to it. Um, related to a question to a thing we were topic we were exploring earlier, you know, when you're sitting next to someone on a plane, maybe think of this and you say, I'm a poet. Like right now there's someone listening to this and whether or not they want to be a poet is, is irrelevant just for the moment, but they want to do something that's crazy. They want to do something or be, or become someone that they don't have, they haven't shared with other people, whether that's, uh, something like gender identity or whether it's a career Think of the, the whole gamut. I'm wondering if you have, you know, deciding, articulating that you were going to be a poet probably had some ramifications. And I'm wondering if you could give advice because I'm telling you that nine out of every 10 people who, who, who are listening, there's something that they want to do or be or become. And then they're not, they're not pursuing that because it sounds crazy or audacious or scary or vulnerable. So many of these words that you've, you've used, I'm wondering if you can give some advice. Yeah, uh, the best advice that I can give is to figure out what that would look like. You don't have to do it. You just have to figure out what it would look like. What would a day look like if you were living your dream? Mm. Um, what would a week look like? What would a month look like? What would a year look like? What would be your practices? What would you do when you first got up? What would you do before bed at night? What would your life look like if you were living the dream, if you were living exactly the way you wanted to live? So there are things in your life that you can have now. Once you make that list of what the life would look like, you'll find that there are things in your life that you can have now and you should capitalize on those things. Um, it takes discipline to do anything, a certain kind of consistency and constancy. Uh, but you do have five minutes. Um, so write for five minutes every day. If you can write for five minutes every day and be grateful for those five minutes, you'll find 10. If you can do that for a few days and be grateful for those 10, you will soon figure a way to find a half hour. Um, and if you can find a half hour every day, <laughs> You are on your way. Do you understand what I'm saying? So yeah. it really just has to do with figuring out everything you want and then looking to see what you have. Um, this has been, you know, I hate to say this. I just had this um, conversation with somebody else, but um, it's easier for me to talk about these things when I talk about material possessions, because sometimes people understand that a little bit better than a, than a sort of floating spiritual concept. So let's say you want a certain kind of car. Let's see, let's say you want a Genesis G90, um, but you have, what do you have? I don't know, you have a Nissan Versa. And <laughs> you don't want the Nissan Versa anymore. How do you get rid of your N Nissan Versa and get into your Genesis G90? You start treating your Nissan Versa as if it is a Genesis G90. Wash it. Because when you have the Genesis G90, you're under the impression that you're suddenly going to be a person who washes your car. You don't wash your car now. Why do you think you're going to wash it? Because you got a new one. <laughs> do you see what I mean? So I just think, you know, it's about making habits that have to do with what you want your life to look like, even if your life doesn't completely look that way right now. How important is the rule of people? The role of people in that picture that you're painting for yourself how, how, how have, has that played an impact or played a role in 
in you being able to live your dream as a poet? Is, was it about surrounding yourself with poems and poetry and people that were, were um, impetus for your work? Like, how, what role has, have people played in shaping who, who you are? If you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, and, and you know, if you believe in that or not, I was wondering if you could share a little insight there. A community is um, of utmost importance. It's really important to go be where the poets are. What I figured out about being a poet is that uh, I wouldn't be one if I couldn't be around them. Uh, I needed to know where the living poets were and what they were doing and how I could get together with, together with them, uh, not just for work, but just socially. You know, being around the poets helps you become a poet. Being around the people who are doing the kind of things that you want to do helps you become more of what you want to do. Uh, that's true. Uh, because those people will identify your desires uh, in themselves and therefore encourage you because they will see that through encouraging you, they are also encouraging themselves and they will be expecting your encouragement. Um, the, the, the most important thing, community is very important, but even more important is that you do not do the opposite of community. I find that a lot of people worry about what people are going to think about their poems. And then they take those poems to the people who they know will discourage them. Like people are always asking me about how I write about my mom and dad as if I would ever take my mom and dad to work. Nobody has taken their mom and dad to work for any other profession. People are like, what did your mom say when she saw this poem? I don't know, did she see it? I don't know, <laughs> what, do I, what do I look like? Um, you know, if I know that my dad wants me to be a lawyer, why am I showing him my poems? Wow. If I know there are things and this is I mean, we we do this all the time. We take the things we love to the people who we know will discourage the things we love. Why? Take them to people who are, you know, are going to encourage them. You take them to people who are going to tell you this is really bad. You can do better. So let's do more. Of that thing, don't take it to people who are going to say this is really bad. Don't do it anymore. You know who those people are. Why are you in their face? Stay away from them. You know, sometimes you got to be around. You know, funerals and stuff. <laughs> you know, Thanksgiving. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I get it. Um, but do surround yourself with encouraging people. Do not surround yourself with discouraging people. And when you have to be around discouraging people make sure there's a timer on that situation. Mm. You know, if you've got, yeah. if for some reason you have to, so for me, I figured out, um, me and my parents, we're really good two nights and then I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that third night, those first two nights, they miss me, I miss them. That third night, they have figured out something that's wrong with my life. And they want to spend that next day telling me all about it. I know that now. So I'm never there the third night. <laughs> Do you understand? And you know who these people are. Don't, I mean, we can pretend, oh, I don't, you know, you know yeah. exactly who these people are. Um, these are people, even people you work with or that you have to work with. You send them the email. Hey, I'll, I'll be in your office, but I can only be in there for a half hour. Because, you know, at 31 minutes, that person starts doing the thing that you hate. And don't go over the half hour. Why do we why do we trot things out to people if we've got big, hairy, audacious goals? We've got crazy dreams. What part of us drags those dreams to the people that we know will say no? The part of us that doesn't want to take the risks, the part of us that doesn't want to take the leap. We're looking for some excuse to get out of doing what we really want to do. We don't want to do the work to do what we really want to do because we know it takes a lot of work. It's, I mean, we do that to ourselves. Those people, people are not stopping you. You are going to people in order to be stopped. That's going to be repeated often after this show. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've written about some, especially in the tradition, about some very, very powerful topics about rape, about murder of unarmed people, black and brown people. Um, so many topics that 
interrupt the complacency of day to day. And do you feel compelled to write those, write about those topics or how do these topics present themselves to you? I don't know if compelled is the word. Maybe compelled is the best word because I would definitely rather not write about them, right? Um, Say more. People are under these imp- this weird impression that um, I sit down trying to go after the police or trying to um, go after environmental injustice or go after my parents or my family or go after um, the person who raped me. I would rather never think about him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm actually not interested in writing about any of those things or reading about any of those things, to be honest with you. Uh, what I do is I sit down with language only, and as I'm writing, I figure out what, I, what I'm saying. So uh, and, you know, I'll try to explain this as best I can without a black, I, I often need a whiteboard and some um, dry erase markers, but I'll try, I'll try to explain. I've got one right here. If I, I wish I could <laughs> be your scribe. I wish I could um, be your scribe next time. You know, I write a line because it sounds good. And I think I wrote it, so it must be good. You know, I have that much audacity. Like, oh, I wrote that, it must be good. And then I follow that line with a, with a line that riffs off of the sound of the first line. I follow that line with a, with a sound that riffs off of the sound of that line. I keep making those lines. People don't know that when I get to the end of a page or when I'm tired of doing that or when I feel like I'm spent or when I feel like I've said something in doing that that seems a surprise to me. Um, by the time I'm done with that, I don't know what any of that says. It doesn't make sense. It just sounds good. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So then I have to go back and ask that mess, because it's a mess. It doesn't make sense. It just sounds good. They're just images. They're, they're words. They're rhymes. They sound good, but they don't make sense. I go back to that mess and I say, who is your speaker? Who would say these things? I say, where are you located? Why is there sand right here? Is this a beach or a desert? I say, what is your location? I say, why are you so mad right here? What happens in this moment? What does that mean? I'm asking myself those questions. I don't need a reader to do that for me, not at that stage. I ask myself those questions and then that, that, that mess of text changes to the first draft of a poem. And by the time it changes to the first draft of a poem, I see from my subconscious mind, my unconscious mind, that I've been writing about the things that I'm really concerned about, the things I'd rather not write about. Um, when I was writing the tradition, I really just wanted to write a pastoral book that was about my front and backyard because I was so excited about having a front and backyard. I was excited about working in the yard. Um, I was upset about my allergies. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh it's impossible. People think people think that you really can write this poem about working in your yard without also being concerned about the lifespan of our trees on this planet. People think that you can work in your yard without. When I first moved in this house, one of my neighbors, um, you know, it's the first time I lived in a neighborhood where people bring you stuff when you first move in. One of my neighbors. The welcome wagon. <laughs> yes, very. I thought it was very strong. I mean, it was really nice. But I just was like, wow, it's 1954. And um, one of my neighbors, she walked up to the door and rung my doorbell while I was right in front of her working in the yard, like working in the flower bed in front of the steps. And she turns around. It's hot outside. She's fanning herself. And um, I say, hi, excuse me. And she says, oh, hey, oh, I'm just I'm just looking for the man or the woman of the house. She didn't imagine that could be me. Wow. So what happens to my poem that day about working in my flower bed? Do you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. I got to tell the truth. It's not just the flowers. Do you follow what I mean? There's this other thing going on where in spite of my heritage, you know, I know how to work on a flower bed because my dad taught me. In spite of my heritage, in spite of generation after generation of black people who work the land, in spite of the fact that both my grandparents, on both sides of my family, my grandparents were sharecroppers. This person and many people like her cannot imagine me working on a yard for its beauty because I own it and I want it to be beautiful. Not because I need a check. 
in a, do you understand what I'm saying? I do, yeah. And that is the kind of thing that ends up in a poem because that's a little deeper. To, <laughs> that's where you end up. Well, let's keep pulling on this thread because what we're into now is your creative process, right? I mean, do, are you writing every day? Like you talk about that's what that day's poem is. So, so is it is is journaling, is writing every day? And this this is going to apply to every single listener, whether they want to you know get better at the guitar, build a startup, uh, you know, be a magician. Uh, it doesn't matter what their craft is. What's your creative process? Obviously, you've talked at different times in this conversation about bringing all these things, you know, into into view, if you will, that that happened. But is this a daily process for you? How, how do you sit down? Is it morning? Is it evening? Is it whenever inspiration strikes or you set the timer and you go to work? What's Dr. Brown's um, prescription for creativity? I just think it's a good idea to do something every day. Uh, so every day I try to write something. And even if that's a sentence, I can go to bed at night knowing that I wrote. Uh, and if you write something every day, you will have many days where you can't stop. Uh, but if you don't write something every day, <laughs> you will have most days where you're uh, the few days that you do write where you're re really just staring at the computer screen. Uh, you also have to remember that writing is not always making something new. Uh, writing has to do with using everything you've ever written and working on it until it's better. So because I've been doing this for a little while, there's always something that I can go back to that has failed in the past. Uh, what I tell my students is uh, if you write 10 failed poems, you're in a better position than somebody who hasn't written any poems. If you've written 10 failed poems, that means you have at least 10 good lines because you're not so awful that you wrote a whole poem without one good line in it. So if you write, if you have 10 good lines, that's really all you need. You take them out of those poems that have failed. You put those 10 good lines on a separate Microsoft Word document. You move them around until they start talking to each other. And these lines that at first seem to have nothing to do with each other will begin to. So that's the kind of thing that I'm doing when I'm writing. And it's better for me to try something every day. Um, sometimes I'm at it for a few hours uh, when things are uh, really uh, going uh, in a, a disciplined and um, and regular fa and hab habitual and regular fashion. I probably write for two hours a day, um, or work, I should say, for two hours a day. And is that morning? You know, is it evening? Is it is it any time? What? Well, um, it depends. I'm fascinated by the by the routines. Yeah, of it's many well, of the here's best what's creators. here's what's ideal. Here's what happens when things are perfect. When things are perfect, I wake up in the morning, I go downstairs and I do a hundred burpees. I come upstairs out of breath and I eat something. After I eat, I sit down and I start writing for about two hours. The way I know it's been two hours isn't because I've set a clock. I know it's been two hours because I'm hungry and I'm usually hungry every two hours. So, <laughs> so when I'm hungry, I get up to eat again. And then whatever I was doing is done for the day. And I did my two hours, but things change, you know, so sometimes it's not that way. Sometimes you got a nine o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning meeting and you don't want to wake up at six in the morning to do some burpees, but you still have to find your two hours between meals to get some writing done. Um, so that's what I'm doing more during the semester, especially now that I'm an administrator more during the semester, I'm looking for two hours. It used to be that I had these two hours kind of sitting around and now I'm like, where are there two hours? Um, so it depends, but I, I'm pretty committed, uh, to that. It's just that, you know, times of year, it's more ideal <laughs> yeah. for me to be able to get up, get some exercise you know, doing exercise, I think, is a good idea for writers because it gets you out of your head and you have no choice. After you do some kind of exercise, you have no choice but to return to the thing new. Um, I, I, I almost want to say strenuous exercise, but I don't want anybody to hurt themselves. What I really mean, though, is that if you're exercising in a way that doesn't allow you to have all the wheels turning. So... Um, you know, if I'm doing a squat or if I'm doing a bench press or if I'm doing, you know, and this might not work for everybody, but this is this works for me. Or if I'm doing burpees, I don't have time 
when there's like weight on me and I'm about to break my neck, I do not have time to think about poetry or to think about, oh, did I pay that bill or to think about, did I pick up the bananas or, you know, I actually can't think about anything except, oh my God, I don't want to die with, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? With 285 with, on your back. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to fall over. I do not, do you know what I mean? I don't want to break my knees. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I am complete. it's completely impossible. And so then when I do go to write, there's nothing there but the writing because I have banished everything else. You know what I mean? Um, so that's what I like to do. It's a way of clearing my head. Um, and then after that, I'm done. And I can you know, meet with my students or grade papers or do whatever else that I have to do throughout the rest of the day. Check emails. I mean, it's, it's taken me hours and hours to get through a day of emails at this point in my life. So, Well, that's what happens when you win the Pulitzer. Tell me about it. <laughs> What's the most difficult aspect of being a professional creator? A translation is really hard. People don't understand what you do or they don't believe you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you, know, I've, you know, it's very difficult, for instance, to date, um, you know, in an age of text messages. You know, if, if I'm working, I mean, if I'm really working, when things are really good, you know, somebody's going to text me. At three, and they're going to say, what you doing? And I'm going to say, working, writing, reading. You know, just reading. I don't even have to be really doing my own thing. Reading a book. You know, when people text you again at five, and they say, what you doing? And you say, reading a book again. And that's really what you're doing. They don't believe you. Because <laughs> nobody believes that you could read for two hours. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's, uh, I think translation is really the hardest part. It's part of the reason why community it's so important. It's part of the reason why it's important to be around people who are doing the kind of thing you do, because then you have conversations with folk. You can have a social life or some part of your social life that isn't completely encumbered with translation. Um, it's very hard to explain to people what I do for a living. And people want to know more about that from me than they do from other people. And they don't understand what those other people do. Nobody know. I don't know what an engineer does. I don't know what they do all day. Well, that's, I, I love the, the practicality of thinking about how do you spend your time every day? Like, what would you do if you were a poet or you were fill in the blank, the thing exactly. that you aspire to do? I think that's exactly like the, I've never heard it put that way. And I think it's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Like, what does preparation look like? And one way to figure that out, if you don't know for yourself, is to ask or to, you know, read or to check out yeah. what does, you know, I mean, what does LeBron James's life look like when he's not playing a real game on the court? And what's interesting to me about that is it generally just looks like he's getting ready to play a game on the yeah. court. Yeah. You know what I mean? What does Beyonce's life look like when she's well, especially not? Especially it's the highest performers in the world, right? That, that, that the dedication and you talked about Serena earlier. Um, the alignment that they have with their life, the things that serve the things that they cared most deeply about. You talked about you know, caring so much about poetry and about words. And if the rest of your life gets to be shaped around the thing that you care about, not, you know, to me, there's this momentum, there's an inertia of it's either reflecting on the last game, or as you said, preparing for the next one, if you're LeBron, mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like that, that, that is how you think about your life with words? You're preparing for your poem or reflecting on the last one? I think I'm always waiting for the next poem. I'm always missing it, wishing it was here, uh, hoping it shows up. I'm always waiting for the next poem. And in the meantime, I'm always reading stuff because uh, the more I read poems by other people, the more I know the next Jericho Brown poem is on its way. Um, so I think... Uh, in the meantime, you know, what am I doing? You know, I'm, I'm on the phone with my mom. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to make love. Like, Figuring out how to not be at that third day of the family function. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. I'm watching Golden Girls. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I mean, what I do, you can still have your time, um, but you have to have some of that time that is dedicated to this thing you claim you love so much. So, well, 
I want to say thank you. Uh, congratulations on the Pulitzer, the, the tradition. If you uh, do not own a copy of it right now and you're listening or watching, I cannot uh, encourage it enough. Um, please pick up a copy and sort of as a culmination to our conversation today and in, I'm, I'm eternally grateful. Um, but I, I would love if you would be open to reading um, a poem for us uh, to to put on display your devastating genius, <laughs> as, as, as has been said. Um, is, there, is there anything that comes to mind if, if I was to ask for you to perform something? Yeah, I'll read a poem called Crossing, um, which I think is uh, very much, uh, for me at least, has very much been a poem of this particular moment. Um, Crossing. The water is one thing and one thing for miles. The water is one thing making this bridge built over the water another. Walk it early. Walk it back when the day goes dim. Everyone rising just to find a way toward rest again. We work Start on one side of the day like a planet's only sun, our eyes straight until the flame sinks. The flame sinks. Thank God I'm different. I've figured and counted. I'm not crossing to cross back. I'm set on something vast. It reaches long as the sea. I'm more than a conqueror, bigger than bravery. I don't march. I'm the one who leaps. Wow. Thank you very, very much for being on the show. Um, again, I've, I've shared a couple of times already on the show that the, the, um, the tradition is, you know, has my highest recommendation. What, uh, are there some other coordinates on the internet? Uh, or out there in the world that you would steer our listeners. We're really good at supporting the people who are on the show. Um, wh where is the best place to uh, find a little bit more about you or your work if people are interested? People can, um, people, I have a website, jerichobrown.com. People can buy the book at jerichobrown.com or at Copper Canyon Press. They can buy the book. Um, I like for people to buy the book at IndieBound. Um, IndieBound is sort of a, um, a centralizing location for all the independent bookstores. Uh, it's very important. If I had to say anything that is interesting, that uh, that I think is really now oriented, is that uh, it's very important that people buy books from independent bookstores, from your local yes. bookseller. Uh, particularly at a time like now, our bookstores have had a very hard time uh, in the pandemic. And so we want to shore up. Uh, their ability to exist. Um, also, I'm on Twitter at Jericho Brown. I'm on Instagram at Jericho Brown One, um, and I'm on Facebook too. Although Facebook is like the worst. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> let's just call it what it is. That place sucks. Right? <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. So you can find me. Incredible. I want to say a huge debt of gratitude. Thank you for inspiring so many. Congratulations on the, the the accolades I've mentioned the the Pulitzer uh, 100 notable books of the year from the New York Times book review I mean the list is long um, please keep doing what you're doing and inspiring so many and uh, from our community to you and yours thank you so much for being on the show thank you thank you Chase all right everybody until next time I bid you adieu.